Okay, so let me go ahead and introduce Gilbert Vicario, who's going to talk to us today about Agnes Pelton. I know many of us um, have been fascinated by her work uh, after seeing it in the current exhibition. So I'm really happy uh, that we're able to offer um, this at such an important time. So we were really pleased to be in contact with Gilbert Vicario, who is giving today's uh, presentation. He has served as the Selig Family Chief Curator at the Phoenix Art Museum since October of 2015 and was appointed to the expanded role of Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs in 2019. He brings more than 20 years of curatorial experience gained at institutions such as the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Boston, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. He oversees multiple departments within the curatorial division, including American art, Asian art, fashion design, Latin American art, photography, European art, art registration, and exhibit design and preparation. Into, in, in addition to his role as a curator of modern and contemporary art, if that doesn't make you tired, uh, I don't know what doesn't. That's that's a lot on one person's plate. Well, in addition, or maybe as part of his role as curator, um, he developed uh, the current exhibition, Agnes Pelton, Desert Transcendentalist, um, which included stops at the New Mexico uh, Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of Art, and is currently at the Palm Springs Art Museum um, in California. So if you will all uh, join me, hopefully, in welcoming uh, Gilbert Vicario. Gilbert, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? OK. Thank you guys so much. Um, well, um, as Elizabeth said, Agnes Pelton, Desert Transcendentalist, is currently at uh, Palm Springs Art Museum. Um, as a uh, result of the pandemic, um, the exhibition actually uh, was shut down for six months in New York um, before opening up last September for two months. And then it opened in Palm Springs in, or was supposed to open in November in Palm Springs and then was shut down um, literally the week it was open. So it was closed for six months. Um, the exhibition is finally opened. Um, they were able to open in April and the exhibition is now uh, running until September 5th. Um, for those of you who didn't see it in Santa Fe, there's still time. Um, I thought as a way of introducing Agnes that I would share a couple of installation shots of, of the show when it opened in Phoenix, um, just to give you a, a sense of the exhibit design um, because it wasn't, we weren't able to duplicate any other venues. Um, but I think it's important. Um, so very few people knew of Agnes that I really felt it was important that Agnes's present was felt in the exhibition. So we did these huge blow ups um, from some of the archival photography that her, her cousin, Nina Dolby lent us. Um, so you can see how that was interspersed as well with images of, of the high desert of Joshua Tree um, in the background, you see a, a little catch a little glimpse of, of, of a Joshua tree and in the front of smoke tree, um, which is one of her favorite subject matter um, in her representational paintings that she did. Um, and I will, I can talk a little bit more of, about the representational work. Um, here's a picture of Agnes um, after she established herself in Cathedral City um, in, in the 1930s. Um, what I'm going to do is basically give you a little biographical overview of Agnes because it, it is quite fascinating. She has such an unusual background um, that uh, it's still it, um, a lot of a lot of the detail I think is still um, in the process of unraveling. Um, some of you may, if if you've known anything of Agnes, you you knew that there um, her grandmother on the maternal side was involved in a very infamous sex scandal called the Beecher Tilton Affair in New York in 1875. Um, Henry Ward Beecher was an abolitionist, but also a very famous preacher in Brooklyn 
Um, he was actually uh, friends with Theodore Tilton, uh, Agnes's grandfather. Um, and it came to light that Elizabeth Tilton, the grandmother actually had an affair um, with Henry Ward Beecher. Um, it was sort of splashed across the New York Times um, in the late 19th century. Um, and it's believed um, that it was one of the reasons why um, Agnes's mother, uh, Florence Tilton, actually relocated to Europe. Um, it was in Europe that she met her, her father or her husband, uh, Will, William Halsey Pelton. Now, William Halsey Pelton was uh, the son of a, of a Louisiana sugar baron and um, was an interesting man. He, he didn't really work, um, uh, was interested in mountaineering and hiking, um, but also was a manic depressive who self-medicated with morphine. Um, Agnes was born in 1881 in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, and this is the earliest um, uh, image that I've been able to find of Agnes. It's a very sweet picture. Um, at the age of seven, uh, Agnes's mother split um, from William Halsey Pelton and moved back to Brooklyn. Um, this is an, actually an image of Henry Ward Beecher. I should have included that one before. Um, what, what you're looking at are subsequent images of, of Agnes. She was quite striking. Um, and luckily there are a lot of really wonderful images of her um, that, that are still in the family. Um, Florence Tilton Pelton uh, moved Agnes back to, to Brooklyn and opened up a piano school. Um, here's also a wonderful portrait of, of her and her mother. Um, Agnes did exhibit um, some artistic talent and actually enrolled at Pratt in, at the Pratt Institute uh, where she studied painting with Arthur Wesley Dow. What you're looking at now is the windmill where Agnes uh, lived and worked um, during, the, during the 20s. Um, here's another kind of wonderful image of her um, in sort of quiet solitude that I, I like to share with, with people. Um, she actually um, what caught the attention of, of a number of people in New York by the, by the teens. Um, she actually became friends with a woman named Mabel Dodge Lujan, um, who was a very influential arts patron. Um, some say um, was responsible for uh, the New York Armory exhibition or helping to fund that exhibition. Um, which Agnes was, was included in at the age of 32. Um, she was creating these paintings, which, um, uh, which she called the imaginative paintings. And they always fig featured these sort of young girls in kind of wood-like settings. They were very symbolist in nature. Um, and it really do dominated the work she was doing at that time. Um, I don't think I have an image. Oh, here's an image of Vinewood. So that gives you a really good Gilbert, I think we lost you for a minute. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. We are frozen. We are frozen, I think. Gilbert, can you? Oh. Hold on, folks. I think we might have lost Gilbert. He might have to come back on here in just one minute. Okay. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay, keep your fingers crossed. Okay, can everyone hear me? 
just nod or wait. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's never happened before. Anyway, so let's move along. So this was the type of work Agnes was creating in, in, in the 1913. Um, I was mentioning a, a, a portable mural commission that she did. And it was something that she did frequently to, to essentially uh, pay the rent, as it were. She would do portraits of, of individuals. Um, she traveled during this time. She had a friend who taught at the American University in Beirut. Um, she was at the Academy in Rome for a year, um, and she traveled to Hawaii. Um, by, by the early 1920s, um, she did away with the figure um, and really focused on abstraction. Um, as you can imagine, Kandinsky was a figure um, that was central to a lot of artists, a lot of young contemporary artists of the time. Um, and Agnes uh, certainly followed and was interested in what Kandinsky was doing. Um, this is a painting from 1925 called The Ray Serene. And it's really the first time that she really does away completely with any representational figures and focuses on abstraction. Um, this one, to me, very much uh, rings uh, to uh, what Kandinsky was doing. Um, I always like to include a lot of sketches that I've I found in her archives in the, in, of American art. Um, this is for a painting called Bean. Um, which here you see the finished piece. Um, and so what basically around this time, uh, Agnes uh, was drawn to a lot of different um, movements and interests around theosophy, um, spirituality, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, um, and a lot, of, a lot of new age ideas that were sort of uh, beginning to take hold in, in the West Coast, actually, in, in, in Los Angeles and San Diego. And so a lot of the, a lot of the works that she did in, in the 1920s really kind of centered around this idea of vibrational energies. As you can see, the way she um, did, uh, chose to represent that. Um, this is a painting called Fountains, um, again, which sort of deals with energy sources of vibrations and colors, um, all of which um, she was exploring at the time. Um, this is a painting, uh, again, of a flower. Um, she, she really came from the symbolist tradition in a lot of ways um, and used flowers quite frequently um, because they, uh, the sort of uh, spiritual and psychological meaning that they could embody. Um, she was, um, in, some, in some cases, compared to George O'Keeffe, um, especially in, in regards to both artists um, painting flowers. Um, but it becomes very clear um, that, that their work was actually quite different. Um, Helton, in fact, I would argue, is not really a Southwest artist in the way that um, O'Keeffe was. Um, coincidentally, Helton, um, did visit New Mexico and, and Taos in particular in 1919 at the invitation of Mabel Dodge uh, Lujan, um, which was 10 years before O'Keeffe um, had ever visited New Mexico. Um, let's see, move on. Here's another example of the way she used um, or was interested in, in, in flower symbolism. But also that um, it's important to, to point out in this painting in particular, uh, a kind of theatricality um, and symmetry that was the device, pictorial device that she favored and that which appears in a lot of her subsequent work. Um, and so theosophy, I mentioned a, a little bit earlier, um, it's important to, to really understand the work of Pelton um, is to initially do away with the, with the notion of her um, simply being an American artist or simply being a uh, artist in the Southwest. Um, the more I began, became interested in Pelton's work, the more to me it really connected on a much larger scale. I began to um, research um, figures that Pelton was drawn to and which she wrote about in her journals. Um, one of them was Helena Blavatsky on the left. 
um, who's a founder of the Theosophical Society um, and was an artist that um, was looked um, and, and regarded by many, many other artists besides Pelton. Um, Annie Besant on the right wrote a book called Color Forms, which um, basically aligned colors to moods and feelings um, and which became very central um, not only to uh, not only to Pelton, but to artists such as Hilma of Klimt um, and others. Um, Nicholas Rorick, um, which you see depicted in, in the center, um, was also an, an important figure um, and was the one who basically uh, was a proponent of what he called Agni Yoga. Um, Agni Yoga was a fire yoga um, and it was something that Agnes was very interested in. She actually practiced yoga, um, but the images of fire then become very, um, very clear in her work. And we'll look at a couple of, of examples of how that manifested. Um, she did very few portraits, but this one is clearly uh, a portrait of Rorick. As you can see in the middle, you can't, you can't uh, mistake the, the kind of those eyes for one in the mustache. Um, other figures that suddenly became uh, important to, to consider in relation to Agnes Pelton um, was a Swiss artist named Emma Kuntz, who was also similarly um, interested in spirituality um, and used something which she called, uh, which she divined using a pendulum, which actually um, helped uh, was part of the whole process that she did. Here's the pendulum process that she used for, for drawings. Um, and here's an example or an image of Emma Kuntz's uh, vortex, um, which is located right outside of uh, Zurich, Switzerland. Um, and of course it became, I became very interested in, in that to the point that I actually traveled to Zurich um, to spend some time um, thinking that, you know, here in, here, in, here in Phoenix, you hear a lot about vortexes. And I thought, well, there's, there's certainly some uh, uh, little trail that's worth, worth connecting Pelton to. Um, here's an example of Emma Kuntz, one of Emma Kuntz's drawings, it, as you can see, very geometric. Um, it would take her in some cases uh, 36 hours to complete the drawings, which she would do nonstop, um, taking no time to sleep or eat um, in the process. Uh, the other artist that you are no doubt familiar with is Hilma of Klimt, who is a Swedish artist um, who uh, was sort of brought to light a few years ago at a large a Guggenheim retrospective. It kind of came about a year before Agnes Pelton opened. Um, but similarly, like Emma Kuntz and Pelton uh, was very interested in, in ideas around spirituality and the occult, um, all of which um, really addresses um, a different time frame for the introduction of abstraction in the 20th century. Um, Hilma of Klimt was doing abstractions about uh, 15 or 20 years before Kandinsky did. And so there's now, you know, beginning to be a whole uh, reappraisal of the timeline of abstraction and the role that women have played in that. So it's very interesting. Um, simply put, abstraction was a way of making the unknown visible. And I think that that is, to me, sort of the central crux of, of the way that their different ideas around spirituality um, were able to manifest visually in their works. Um, Pelton often used the lotus in her paintings. This is a painting called Lotus for Lyda. Um, here's another image that is a little clearer. Um, as you can see, the central uh, figure in the, in the bottom is, is of a lotus with the flame sort of coming up in the middle. And then what appears to be six points of light. Um, the flame, as I mentioned earlier, um, connected to the idea of, of, of light um, as light sources um, for spiritual 
um, enrichment and enlightenment um, and appeared frequently in the works. So in the late 1920s, Pelton um, made her way to California. She spent time um, around a literary circle that was uh, started by uh, Will Levington Comfort. Um, it was sort of the, the center of the New Age movement. And there were several figures um, that Agnes uh, met while in Pasadena. Uh, Dane Rudyard, um, who is also, I believe, featured in the exhibition, um, was an experimental music musician, poet, um, and edited something called The Glass Hive, which was a, a journal um, dealing with these sort of new age ideas. Um, by the late, as I said, by 1929, she decided to move to the desert, having visited um, Cathedral City while spending time in California. What you're looking at now is an image of the water mill, which is where her studio was located in Long Island. Um, and this is a painting that Pelton did um, of, of the water mill. Um, it was around 1932 that she settled in Cathedral City. And here again is an image of, of Agnes. Um, she was almost 50 um, at this time um, and is where she really began to draw on a lot of the elements in her past work. So there was definitely an attraction to landscape in the work that she did in, in, uh, in Palm Springs Cathedral City. It was a way of bringing abstraction and a way of giving a spirituality um, form, but also um, contextualizing it within the landscape, which she found so inspiring. Um, this is a painting called Messengers, which she painted in 1932, um, followed by this uh, wonderful image of a dust storm. Um, now, at the time, I believe there were more dust storms in Palm Springs, um, not so many now because of all of the um, uh, all of the, the building construction somehow has prevented prevented them from being so prevalent. Um, not sure why that hasn't stopped them in Phoenix. <laughs> We've been having them every night for the last couple of days. Um, by 1932, um, she was included in an exhibition in Santa Fe that was organized by Raymond Johnson. Um, and that was the first time her work was, was exhibited in, in, in New Mexico, I believe. Um, this is a wonderful painting called Winter, which um, I believe is hanging at the museum right now. Um, which gives you another example of, of the ways that she used abstraction and realism uh, together. Um, very much uh, uniquely Agnes in that sense with the two uh, pigeons in the bottom of the painting um, and this strange kind of oval figure um, in the center uh, of the painting. That figure is, is again repeated um, in a piece, uh, in a painting she called was titled MOS. And it's funny, this, this painting was actually lost for many years. Um, and when Michael Zakian did her first exhibition in Palm Springs in 1995, um, this is well before the internet took hold and um, they basically put an ad out in the newspaper asking people if they knew of any Peltons or if they owned any Peltons. Um, most of the responses that they got back were of people who owned a lot of the re uh, representational paintings she did of the smoke trees and the desert landscapes. Um, but there was one owner who, who contacted Michael in the museum and said, I have this really weird painting. I'm not even sure um, what it is, but it's initialed MOS. Um, so Michael went to see the painting um, and indeed um, concluded that it was a Pelton. Um, and based on some of the notes and some of the writings that, um, that Michael was able to get his hands in, um, MOS was uh, basically an abbreviation for Mother of Silence, which is actually the title of this painting. Um, it's believed to be the, uh, the only painting that was dedicated to her mother. 
um, and then you can see the, the sort of umbilical cord like forms in the center of the painting. Um, but she often spoke of, of MOS, of Mother of Silence. Um, she, she actually sought guidance from the painting. It hung in her studio. Um, and in some of the writings, she would mention MOS uh, doesn't think it's a good, good day to paint or MOS thinks I should wait. So it was a very strange but very revealing um, aspect of, of Pelton's life and practice and how those two things blended. Um, Orbits is another wonderful um, representation of the San Jacinto Mountains um, in, in, uh, that, that are clearly viewed um, from Cathedral City. Um, these were one of the paintings that um, had been lost for many years. Um, and it's something that I can, I will talk a little bit about towards the end of this lecture. Um, the painting was actually discovered in a resale store in Santa Monica, California, um, and was rescued from there. Um, it is now owned by the Oakland Museum of Art. Um, here's another uh, wonderful pr uh, preparatory drawing for a painting called Day, which is in the collection of Phoenix Art Museum. Um, and it gives you great insight into the notes that she would take and really the, the, the process that she would undergo uh, to construct a painting. Um, it was very, it, in a way it was very deliberate. Um, nothing was left to chance. Um, and all of the, the, the writing and her thinking um, was very, very important in, in her construction of, of these works. I struggled tremendously um, in reading her handwriting. Um, and apparently other, other people have mentioned that as well. But um, in any case, you, you have more of an idea of, what, of how she worked. Here's the, uh, the final product, as it were. Um, and the rectangular form that you see in, in, in this abstraction um, is something that is repeated um, in subsequent works. Um, she thought of these as doors or portals to the other side. Um, and it's something that she repeated um, in other works um, as she um, matured and as, it, uh, as time progressed, it became more of a central um, idea in, in the work is of, of moving to the other side. Um, here again is a, sort of this wonderful painting, portrait, excuse me, of Pelton. Uh, with the TPG uh, catalog in her hands. Um, on the left you see on the easel um, is Messengers from 1932 and above that is Mother of Silence. Um, and so her, her involvement with the Transcendental Painting Group really was, was at the, um, came about with uh, Raymond Johnson's interest in Pelton. Um, they, obviously exhibited together, um, at least going back till 1933. Um, and so I was able to find some interesting documentation at the Archives of American Art, um, where Raymond is, is trying to convince Agnes to join the group and to, begun, to become the honorary president. Now, what I didn't have my hands on were actually out Agnes's responses to Raymond's letters. But now I figured those are probably in his archives in, in Albuquerque. So, and maybe Michael Duncan has, has already delved into that, but it was, it was something that I just, it occurred to me as I was putting this lecture together. Fires in Space from 1938, again, um, repeating that fire um, imagery that was so important to her work. Um, Fires in Space, I believe, was included in a TPG show um, in 1938. Um, this painting was recently um, sold at auction um, in, 20, in 2018 um, in New Jersey. Um, and it was funny because I, um, someone had sent me a text saying Fires in Space is at auction and you won't believe what they're selling it for. Um, I looked at the website and it was estimated between two and three hundred dollars. Um, it <laughs> that price went that price shot up very quickly, and I think the final hammer price was two hundred thirty thousand dollars. 
so there's more more correspondence i'm only sharing this with you um only because of the wonderful tpg logo um that raymond designed for for the group um but what i'm actually really excited to share with everyone is something that uh i got my hands on very late um in the research of my exhibition um these were in the collection of margaret stainer who was uh, the, the first art historian to work on Agnes Pelton in the 1980s. Uh, Margaret has this uh, treasure trove of drawings and studies um, in her home in Northern California. Um, and I encountered these really wonderful little um, illustrations of her work, um, which in fact were instructions that she wrote to, to Raymond, that she sent to Raymond Johnson of how she wanted her work installed um, in the TPG show in 1938. Um, as you can see on the left is Messengers, which is a painting that, that we own, um, Illuminations in the middle. Um, but she was very careful um, to give very precise um, instructions on the hanging high and on the distribution of the works. There are also works of art um, of paintings that have been lost. Um, that, you know, at this point, we're really not sure of where any of these any of these works are. Um, it's believed that she painted around 100 um, of her abstractions, um, but thus far, I've only been able to locate around 50. So it's still, it's sort of a mystery. Um, here's an, another wall in, in the TPJ show with the winter uh, painting that you have right now on view um in in albuquerque um but these are, i just thought these were really wonderful um i wanted i i'm throwing throwing in some of these clippings only to to suggest that um as um quiet as agnes was um a little attention she got um there were some wonderful uh, signs of recognition that she got in California. So there's quite a number of, of reviews that came out. This one uh, is from the Santa Fe, New Mexican. Um, this is a painting called The Blessed um, by, from 1941. Um, she believe only stayed with the TPG group until about uh, 1940, 1941. Um, but it's very important to understand her relationship to the group. Um, she was, um, in fact, a, an older generation. A lot of the artists in, in the group looked up to her. Um, but it's also clear that as, as with Pelton, a lot of the TPG artists were also interested in um, these alternate forms of spirituality and abstraction, um, which you know, creates this, a very strong argument for really reassessing this period. Um, and really, I think in many ways, changing the narrative of, of abstraction in the 20th century in a very interesting way. Um, by the 1940s, she continued with this idea of light. Um, these, this is an example of, of, of really the sort of remarkable handling of paint um, and of creating this really strong presence of of bright, bright light in the compositions, which I think is quite extraordinary. Um, this is the painting that was dedicated to her father. Um, as I mentioned to you, the father um, was uh, uh, an avid hiker and mountaineer um, in Europe, um, but was also manic depressive. Um, and I believe Agnes was around nine years of age um, when um, her father went back to New Orleans um, and died of a morphine overdose. Um, and this image um, depicts the father. You can sort of see the profile um, and the sort of mountains um, and of this sort of trumpet blaring, um, which is very interesting. Um, these are uh, other pieces that she did in the 19, 1940s. Um, she begins to have a, a much more uh, a refined approach. Um, this is a painting that is notable 
um, it's called Future, excuse me, it's Future from 1941. And you recall that I mentioned the sort of windows um, that appeared in her work at this time. But those two columns that you see in the, in the front, in, in the sort of the center of the composition, those are actual um, features um, when you drove through Cathedral City in the 1940s that sort of welcomed you into Cathedral City. So there were elements that were drawn from reality, which she incorporated um, into her compositions. This was birthday from 1943 uh, when she turned 60, um, which again shows uh, very much adhering to this very theatrical symmetrical composition, um, employing the color blue, which was, was very prevalent in her work, um, the star imagery, um, and the low horizon line, which you, you, you can see here um, at the bottom of the painting. Um, by the 1940s, um, she decided to stop painting abstractions and return to her representational paintings of the desert. Um, part of that had to do with the fact that she um, was declining in health and actually needed to, to sell. Um, the, the abstractions rarely sold, although she managed to sell a painting uh, to the San Diego Museum of Art um, in the mid 1930s. But really to, in order to pay the rent, she had to, she had to sell um, a lot of the uh, desert abstractions. So she really focused on that um, for a large part of the 1940s. Um, this painting again, um, emphasizes her interest in that sort of white center, that white light, which became very um, important in her work um, around this time. Um, this painting, and I'm just referring to my guy here, um, was painted in 1947. It's called Light Center. Uh, and it really sort of um, demonstrates a, a, a particular direction that she was going in. Um, she wasn't painting that much. Um, here again, it's another image of, of that light center that fascinated her. Um, and again here um, in a painting that, let's see if I can get that, called Departure from 1932, uh, excuse me, from 1952. I also want to mention that um, in 1954, the New Yorker published a two-part article on the Tilton Beecher affair. Um, many people speculated about Pelton's um, uh, reclusive style, as shall we say, she was very personal, you know, she was a very private person. Um, she never married, she never had any children. Um, and many people have speculated that th that affair um, left a, an indelible scar in her family. Um, I don't know how uh, the resurgence of that in the New Yorker article, if that played any um, role or if she reacted in any way to that, um, I, I have not been able to, to, to really find any evidence of that. Um, but it certainly was not something that was a welcome thing. Um, Idol from the 1950s as well, um, combining a very clearly uh, representational view of the desert with these colored, um, almost like lights of color dancing in the foreground. Um, it, it's believed that, that she did a second version of, of this painting 1959 to 1961, which is the year she died. Um, and so it's actually unfinished um, and remains um, at this point to be the last, um, it, uh, the last work of art that she made. Um, here's a picture of Agnes um, in, her, in her 70s. Um, and I wanna end by showing a few images that I've just was uh, shown uh, not too long ago. Uh, these are all uh, lost Peltons. Um, 
but I, you know, think it's important to be able to give people an idea of, of what those look like. Um, when she died in 1961, um, again, she left no heirs. Um, and it was really the cousins who had to sort of deal with her estate. Um, and which is one of the reasons why so many of her works um, disappeared. Um, some of them were no doubt destroyed um, and others I'm hoping are, are simply haven't come to light. Um, but um, it's important to, to demonstrate that, um, but really to, in order to give you an account of, of an artist that I think only now has really become um, somebody that people are interested in. I was actually um, approached by young painters in Los Angeles who were drawn to Pelton's work. And that was sort of my initial um, inspiration for doing the exhibition, um, was showing how the work was really in some ways, um, it, it was waiting for a moment for it to be appreciated um, when we're only really beginning to understand um, the history of 20th century art and the role that women have played in that um, and really being able to give uh, uh, audiences an understanding of how um, individuals like Pelton really um, have, have been instrumental in, in forging um, unique paths forward um, in contemporary art. And I think a lot of young painters are inspired by that. So I think I'm going to end there and um, thank you so much. Gilbert, thank you so much. Thank you so much, I mean, for sharing with us this wealth of knowledge um, that you've gained on Agnes Pelton. It's amazing insight uh, into her works. Um, we do have some uh, questions in the chat. Did you want to take a look at those or did you want me to read those? Whatever you well, feel. I'll, I'll let you edit them. Okay, let's no. see what we got here. All right. Um, I think you touched upon this. Um, this is a question asking about, did she seek to market her transcendental paintings um, or just her other work, the portraits and landscapes to earn a living? was she fearful of her family's previous notoriety? I think that's a follow-up question. Um, okay. Yeah, to that. Thank, thank you for that question. But I, wa I wanna make sure, I wanna be clear, um, it's important not, not to characterize her entire work as transcendental um, because really her, her involvement with the, with the transcendental painting group was, was short-lived. Um, albeit important, I don't, I don't want to disregard um, the, the wonderful way that her work connected with that, uh, that movement. Um, but I, I only say that because I've written, I've read in the past um, articles that, that claim that Pelton was inspired by the, by the TPG and not the other way around. Um, regarding her, her promote, her, her her promotion, self-promotion or, or lack thereof. Um, I always have to um, bring up uh, the topic of O'Keeffe as a comparison. Um, I love O'Keeffe um, very much. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the I think one of the, the difficulties um, comes from the fact that we tend to, we, we tend to lump individuals together and so in this case, and, and do that unfairly. So in this case, two women artists who worked in the Southwest, Southwest slash West automatically get associated and, and assumed um, that, for example, Pelton was a second, a second class O'Keefe. Um, and that really ma it, it makes me angry in some ways. Um, but having said that, you know, an artist like O'Keeffe, you know, she she had the um, privilege of of having an Alfred Stieglitz who was able to promote her work on the East Coast. Um, Pelton didn't seem to care about that. She was, you know, she was intent 
on working quietly in solitude in California. Um, she was quite happy um, producing works. Um, I think she craved that solitude, um, which many people have suggested was a result of, of some of those emotional scars that her family suffered. Um, but it's really unclear. Um, she did get attention though. There were a number of, of re exhibition reviews um, and articles that came out uh, at, the, at the time. Um, but it was simply the problem of, first of all, being a woman artist, not being in New York and doing abstraction at a time when it really wasn't the thing. Um, it was still considered to be sort of strange um, and otherworldly. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, somebody like Hilma of Klimt, who was doing it 20 years before Kandinsky. Um, I think she knew that her work wouldn't get the attention it, it really deserved. Um, and as some of you might know, um, when Hilma of Klimt died in 1944 at the age of 80, um, her uh, family inherited the works and she instructed them not to um, exhibit them for 20 years. Um, and so there's this idea that, you know, in both Pelton's case and in Off Klimt's case, they realized that what they were doing, the, the audience at the time was not ready for that. And that kind of adds a whole, I guess, another layer of mystique to the work. Yeah, great, thank you. So this is a question about some of her imagery. Um, was there a spiritual reason that she often chose bilateral symmetry? Wow, that's a very good question. I don't have the answer to that. I don't have the answer to that. I think that um, to me, they, they resemble stage sets in some ways. There's a theatricality about it. And, and that's not to say that it didn't veer from that, but you know, it, you can see it even in these images that are up on the screen. Um, for example, there's a very much of a sort of symmetrical composition. Um, the one on the left, which resembles a jar with veins on the outside, um, and this, not sure what you would call that, almost like a vul vulva-like image at the bottom of it. She actually did not ever exhibit that because she thought it was too racy. She thought it was too controversial. <laughs> Which gives you another an, an, an insight into her work. It's probably good because yeah. she'd be called she like, probably be called like O'Keefe, that that's all that she, then she'd be named for, you know, yeah. doing that in all of her works and people would spend time yeah. obsessing about it, wouldn't they? <laughs> that. Well, and you know, and you know, people have, people are, have obsessed about her sexuality. You know, because she never married, because she never, you know, people are very curious. And actually, Elizabeth, you were mentioning the 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 novel, the Pelton novel you're reading, which right. actually does, I think they do go there. They do explicitly reference a girlfriend or somebody that she was attracted to. So. Yeah. In fact, there were some comments about this, but um, as far as I know, it's just speculation. There's... Um, nothing anybody knows um there was you know. well there was one uh something that michael zakian discovered in her diary when she was quite young and her mother was her mother had the piano school in brooklyn um, and she did confess that she was attracted to one of her mother's students who was a female so mm -hmm. Yeah, but, they, yeah, but you can imagine how difficult it, it must have been, you know, for anyone to to disclose that and, and to want to remain private. So in some ways, I I, I favor respecting her privacy um, because there's really nothing, you know, it really wasn't the focus of the work per se. She was a spiritualist and she was interested in, in different different um, traditions of that. Um, and that was really her focus in the work. So this question is about her frames. This is something we noticed a lot in our exhibition. They're so beautiful, so many of them. Do you, is there any connection? Did she frame <laughs> these works? Do you know if she had any role in them or was it just random collectors or? 
Yeah, I love that question. It comes up every time I give a talk, the frame, the issues about the frames comes up. So no, Agnes, uh, you know, she didn't have the means to build these elaborate gilded frames um, of which I know some of the paintings in, in your show, yes, they have these really beautiful, beautiful frames. Those are all fabricated by the, um, no doubt by the collectors or the museums. However, um, some of them have the Raymond Johnson frame on them. But the Raymond Johnson frame, which you can actually, if you go through the exhibition, I'm sure all of his paintings have his frames on them. They're very simple and they have this a small lip around them. Um, some of her works were, were framed in the Raymond Johnson frame. Um, but the really the fancy gilded ones were not not hers at all. She didn't she didn't have the money to do that. Yeah, yeah. There's some great, rather simple silver, almost look Art Deco ish in a way <laughs> uh, frames. There's a lot of those in the show, and I assumed it was like museums or collectors that really like that in her work. But there is one that's very ornate, and I can't remember the piece it's in, but it almost looks jarring. Oh, I, oh, I know exactly which one. <laughs> that's, that's the one that's owned by, it's the Buck Collection and it's owned by the Irvine, I think it's owned by UC Irvine. So that one, you know, I, that is a, a, a lesson in what not to do. And because the frame literally fights against the imagery and it really, it, that actually was like my least, I actually have an image, I think I have an image of it at the very beginning. Um, it actually makes you think less of the composition, which is right. quite beautiful. Um, I'm going to just bring it up because it, you know, that really bugged me <laughs> back me when too. I did. <laughs> and I could, you know, I just didn't have the, the resources to, or a conservation staff to say, pop the frame and put it in another, <laughs> which a lot of curators would have done. Um, these go, these are in my installation. There, there it is. Yes. Oh, yes, that's correct. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of the others are like yours on the right, the piece on the right, the alchemy, with just alchemy. more, yeah, more um, simple, you know, uh, frames. Yeah. Absolutely, cool. Yeah, yep, that's it. Um, so this one is about kind of that relationship between or non relationship between O'Keefe and and um, Agnes Pelton. Have you this one is inquiring if you've heard um, anything about what did did O'Keefe ever comment on Pelton's work from anything that you ever saw? I, I don't think O'Keefe ever commented commented on Pelton, but Pelton did comment on O'Keefe. Um, simply to say that they were that they took very different approaches. Mm -hmm. So you know, O'Keeffe's flowers. O'Keeffe was interested in the surface of the flower, whereas uh, Pelton, who really came from that symbolist background, was really interested in the flower as a as a symbol for something um, and having this sort of inner life. Um, she often wrote poems to accompany her her paintings. Um, especially in the 1920s. Um, many of the paintings that we showed featured the, the poetry that went along with the paintings. So she was very serious about um, making that connection. Um, and also the titles, you know, when you start looking at O'Keeffe's titles versus Pelton's titles, it's very different. It's very, very different. O'Keeffe is very matter of fact. It, it's an, almost an it is what it is title. Um, but but uh, Pelton, um, she struggled a little more in trying to 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 name uh, these compositions, and so they're all very poetic. Yeah, and some of them with poems, actually. Yes, yeah. we have a couple, I think, in our exhibition that actually have poems accompanying them, which is pretty amazing. Um, I don't think you probably are planning this any any soon yourself, but this person is asking about another large retrospective. I, I assume there isn't probably one on the horizon that you're aware of anytime soon because yours is still out and traveling. Oh, so for Pelton. <laughs> so 
So here's the funny thing. So, you know, I, you know, everybody thought that my show was going to be, that it was going to be a sleeper show. Nobody really thought too much about it, but, you know, I had the high museum in, in Atlanta who was dying to take the show. Um, and now that it's in Palm Springs, I've had two museums inquire as to the continuation of it. Unfortunately, the, sh the, the paintings have been out on loan for almost three years. Um, some of the collectors are afraid they're gonna die before they get their Peltons back. So my sense, um, and, and I'm actually, I, I am interested in, in thinking about that, but I'm thinking about it in a European context. Um, I think she would be um, a huge revelation for European, if not German audiences. I actually did try to sell the show to a museum in Munich. Um, they love the idea. They just didn't have it on their schedule. Um, and there were several other factors. Um, someone told me that I should look, pitch it to a museum in Stuttgart, Germany, which is where she was born um, as a possibility. Um, there is in fact a large um, survey exhibition that opened at the Pompidou in Paris about I believe a month and a half ago, that is a history of women and abstraction in the 20th century. Um, that's very, you know, you should look at that. Um, Pelton, you know, unfortunately they, well, they, they didn't borrow any works of Pelton's to include in the exhibition. However, there's a special room of documentation um, and they're providing the sort of uh, uh, ongoing slide, uh, quote unquote, slide projection of other women abstractionists. Um, and they've included Pelton in that. So Pelton is at least uh, symbolically part of that exhibition. Um, and I think she will um, continue to, to gain attention. Um, as I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but the catalog is going into a second print run. Uh, and, and the publisher wants to do another catalog. So I'm sort of negotiating to do a small publication on Pelton, um, probably for next year. Great, awesome. Um, there was a question, I believe, asking about when, how long our exhibition runs through, and I'm double checking here, September 26th at Albuquerque Museum, the Transcendental Painting oh, Group. I hope to come. I really hope to see the show. Yeah, yeah. We're so glad that, uh, yeah, that things are things are opening up I quite did. a bit. And yeah, uh, yeah that, that we're all going to be able to do a little bit more traveling. And now that I know Desert Transcendentalist is at the Palm Springs Museum till the uh, September the 5th, um, I'm a big fan of the area of the Joshua Tree, uh, Joshua Tree Monument. It's one of my favorite places to go. Love that area, love that deserty area. So it gives me another excuse to, to maybe head out there for Labor Day, so. Well, I'll make, you know, I'll add one other thing that I didn't mention. So the show in Palm Springs is my exhibition, but the curator in Palm Springs decided to do a, a, a companion show. So there is a companion show of all of her desert landscapes. Oh, wow. There are about, there are about 25 paintings and, and sketches in that. And so it's really wonderful. Hey, um, hey. I love the smoke trees and they've subsequently be become my favorite as well. So you'll be able to see both sides of her practice. Oh, awesome. Very, very good. Well, thank you so much, Gilbert. It was a joy to have you here. I feel like um, I know I learned a lot about her work um, and continue to gain more and more appreciation. I was one of those people who not, knew nothing about her uh, before the show came on. So um, I'm really thrilled uh, that we were able to share this uh, with our visitors today. So Gilbert, do your best to stay cool in Phoenix. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and we'll do our best here. We're not okay. going to complain about the heat, even though it's pretty hot for us here. Uh, and uh, thanks again. And good luck on all those publications. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take care. Yeah.